today's presentation. We'll hear from our very own Dr. Savage and Yang. First, we'll hear from Bogdan about economic conditions and trends of indemnity measures from our core benchmarking studies. And then we'll hear from Rebecca about the impact of fee schedule choices and changes on outpatient facility payments. Bogdan? Thank you, Ramona, and good afternoon, everybody. We have started this conference yesterday by talking with Catherine Abraham about the economic impact of COVID-19. Today, we'll discuss lessons from prior WCRI studies to help us understand what current economic conditions may mean for workers' compensation system. As was mentioned at this conference before, we are living through an economic disruption like nothing most of us have seen in our lifetime. And few things illustrate this better than change in employment for this and prior recessions. And that's what I show on this chart. Many jobs disappeared in a matter of weeks. Some have come back, but we are still more than 9 million jobs short from where we were a year ago. And this is the number I had to check twice. Right now, the employment is down more than 6% relative to a year ago. This employment situation is about the same as the worst of what we had in the Great Recession. And if you remember, back in 2009, we did not have to deal with the pandemic. And of course, there, was, there are many more uh, striking graphs about the impact of current downturn. Just look up statistics on hotel occupancy, TSA airport screenings, or Las Vegas convention traffic. Currently, the unemployment rate in the US is 6%, and about 10 million people are considered unemployed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But this measure hides substantial challenges that the workers are facing. Many workers have left labor force. We also see an increasing number in people who are considered long-term unemployed. And this number typically increases in the recession is what we see here, and all, often continues to go up even after the econ economic downturn is over. Currently, there are about 4 million people who have been unemployed for more than 26 weeks and are looking for a job. So those are considered long-term unemployed. And of those who have a job, about 6 million are working part-time even though they would like to have a full-time job. And that's what we show on this uh, chart. Again, this number spikes in a recession, and it means that even workers who have a job, they still have substantially con substantial concerns about their current employment or their ability to find a new job if they, if they had to. And that's also what we see uh, in a Gallup survey that asked uh, workers with a job, whether they were worried about being laid off in a, in a near future. And we clearly see an increase in concerns about job security, similar to what we have seen in 2008. In summer 2020, the percent of people who said that they were concerned about being laid off in the near future increased to about 27%. Well, why does this matter? When we first saw this increase in 2008, we've done analysis looking at how concerns about job security contribute to uh, duration of temporary disability benefits. So in that study, we highlighted the following trade-off. We know that increases in, in unemployment rate lead to longer duration of TD benefits, temporary disability benefits. Well, this is expected, right? Since it's more difficult to find a job after an injury if the economy is not doing well. However, when the workers are concerned about their job security, they tend to speed up their return to work. And this effect prim partially offsets the direct effect of the unemployment increase. And similar factors may apply in this recession. Um, but we need to be concerned not only about job security now, but also in cha about changes in nature of risks at work and really large disruptions in the nature of work itself. So how do identity benefits vary with economic conditions? Well, let's look at this chart. Here we show you the long-term 
trends in identity payments per claim at various maturities. And the data here summarizes uh, measures for 18 states included in our Comscope studies. Uh, the 2008-2009 recession is, hi is highlighted in gray. And at the bottom, you can see a table that sort of summarizes rates of growth and cost in across different time periods. So what do we see? Prior to the 2008-2009 recession, the indemnity payments per claim were growing at about 4% per year across all maturities. During the recession, the indemnity benefits per claim were growing a little bit faster at about 6 or 7% per year. And after the recession, the indemnity payments were again growing at about 3 or 4% per year. This increase in identity benefits was driven primarily by an increase in duration of temporary disability benefits during the economic downturn. And you can clearly see it on this chart. The average duration of temporary disability benefits increased about 3% per year between 2007 and 2009. And it was clearly a period of slightly higher increases in duration of TD benefits than before or after the recession. We can actually look a little bit deeper and see how duration of disability changed across industry groups. This chart shows the average duration of temporary disability benefits at 36 months of maturity across main industry and occupational groups for 2007 through 2011. And one thing that we notice is that duration of temporary disability benefits increased across most groups between 2007 and 2009. But one industry that stands out is construction. We see that between 2007 and 2009, the duration of temporary disability benefits increased about two and a half weeks or more than 10% for this industry group. So one factor behind this, maybe that construction was one of the harder hit industries in 2008-2009 recession. And here we show you changes in employment relative to January 2008. Construction here is a solid, it's a solid blue, blue line. It experienced one of the largest drops in employment in percentage terms, and it was followed by new manufacturing. And there were, of course, quite a few industries, like two industries on this chart that were less affected, such as healthcare and educational services. Those are the two. Uh, two top lines on this chart and employment for these industries basically continued to grow. But as many of you know, the current recession is different. So let's compare employment losses for a couple of industries. And here you show you the same information as before, except I'm showing 2008 and 2020 recession by comparing how much employment changed from the start of the economic downturn. This time, the industry with the largest decrease in employment is leisure and hospitality, which includes restaurants and hotels. In this industry, more than 20% of jobs are still lost. And jobs in healthcare and also in education are behaving differently this time, right? We do see a decline in both of those uh, industries. So we need to be careful when thinking about industry effects since evidence from prior recession may not fully apply. It's also helpful to think about how use of medical care changes in an economic downturn. So why do we care? Well, longer duration of TD benefits means longer treatment and more visits to doctors. And of course, doctors are willing to provide care to injured workers in a recession because there's probably fewer patients with employer provided health insurance coverage. And uh, so, what we see here is that trends for uh, number of visits to physicians, they clearly increased during 2008, 2009 recession. Uh, that's highlighted here in gray. And we see those increases in number of visits to physicians across uh, all claim, claim maturity. So this is consistent with our expectations. We also see that uh, number of visits for evaluation and management services, like office visits, 
uh, increased across all of the industry groups. There is slightly higher increase in, in many of the industries for construction, but it's, you know, we see similar increases across many of the other industry groups. So let's recap our main takeaways from this presentation. We know that duration of temporary disability benefits increases in an economic downturn, but the behavioral factors may still play a role. Concerns about job security matter. And this time there are important differences from what we experienced in the past. You know, changes in nature of risks, changes in affected industries. And we also need to worry about interactions with the medical system and about how the care is provided. We don't have answers about all of this yet, but there are a few things to take into account. The medical system is looking to provide more care to those who need it. And um, you know, this is just anecdotal evidence, so take it with a grain of salt. But over the last two weeks, we had two different doctors reach out to my wife and me to schedule the next meetings with them. And they were clearly going through their books to find people who have not been in their offices for a while. And this may mean good news for workers who need care now, right? Because the doctor offices are opening. At the same time, there is also pent up demand for medical care as many people have delayed their care over the last year. So they will be competing for care with injured workers who are, recovered, who are recovering after their injuries. So that's all I wanted to cover today. Thank you for, your jo for joining us. And uh, now I would like to pass the mic to Dr. Yang. Thank you, Bogdan. Good afternoon, everyone. So today I'll be talking about the impact of fee schedule on outpatient facility payments. The hospital outpatient and ambulatory surgical center facility payments as in, um, represent an important portion of the workers' comp uh, medical payments. They're often a driver of medical growth as well. So with the um, hospital consolidations and increasing market power and the changes these facilities um, face due to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, there's been an increasing interest among the policymakers and stakeholders to understand the role of fee regulations on facility payments. So my presentation today relies on several WCI reports. We'll discuss how different fee schedule bases shape the uh, interstate comparison on outpatient facility payments and how the changes in fee schedules influence the trends in facility payments. We'll also look into the factors in addition to fee schedule that affect the changes in facility payments. Outpatient facility payments represent an important portion of workers' comp medical payments. They represent 15% or more of the total medical payments in most study states. Here on this slide, we show you a distribution of outpatient facility payments across hospital, outpatient departments, and ASCs. You can see the proportion is different across states. States use different approaches to regulate reimbursement to facilities. Here we use different colors to identify the different uh, the states with various hospital outpatient regulations. States in black use a um, fee schedule that assign a specific reimbursement rate to each procedure or each group of procedures in their hospital outpatient regulation. We call this type of regulation fixed amount fee schedule. Most of these states base their workers' comp outpatient facility fee schedule on Medicare ambulatory payment classification or Medicare APC fee schedule. States highlighted in yellow here base their reimbursement on percentage of hospital charges. 
Another group state shown with stripes here define a, a cost to charge ratio for the reimbursement. If a hospital's charges um, were significantly higher than the actual cost in a year, then the uh, cost to charge ratio would result into a smaller number in the following year and therefore a lower payment level. Several other states shown with dots here use other type of hospital outpatient fee schedule, which include combinations of different um, fee schedule basis. There are also a group of states that do not regulate their hospital outpatient reimbursement. We show them in blue here. States with no color are not included in our study. So this map is for hospital outpatient regulation. The ASC fee schedule map is, is just as colorful as this one. Some states use the same or similar approach on uh, both type of facilities, while some others use different methods. Different fee schedule basis is an important factor for um, in the interested uh, variation in the hospital outpatient payments. So here we show you the hospital outpatient payment for similar surgeries across states. They range from 66% below the median state in Nevada to 136% above the median state in Alabama in 2018. So we use the same color, same color coding, if you will, on this chart as we just showed you in the previous slide. You can see that the blue bars and yellow bars clustered towards the right-hand side of the slide. This means states with charge-based fee schedule and states with no fee schedule for hospital outpatient reimbursement tend to have higher hospital outpatient facility payment compared to most states with fixed amount fee schedule. Other WCR studies also found a similar uh, result for ASC, states with a percent of charge based fee schedule or no fee schedule had higher ASC payment than most states with fixed amount fee schedule. Many states have implemented changes in their hospital outpatient and ASC fee schedules since 2005. So here we summarize the lessons from some common changes. A growing number of states adopted a Medicare APC-based fee schedule. Among these states, many experienced the decreases in their facility payments following the fee schedule change, while many others had increased or little change in the facility payment after adoption, uh, after adoption of the Medicare APC fee schedule. We found that the direction of the change in the uh, facility payments depended on the introduced fee schedule levels compared with the prior reimbursement level. Also, among these states, Medicare fee schedule changes often become an important factor um, after the adoption of the Medicare-based fee schedule in the uh, changes in the facility payment trend on the workers' comp side. Another common pattern we observed was that some states combined the elements of fixed amount fee schedule and the percent of charge-based fee schedule in their fee regulation. So in these states, growth in charges often become a, um, remains a driver of the increase in the facility payments. Let's look at one example state for each point. The first example is Virginia. Virginia adopted a hospital outpatient and ASC facility fee schedule in 2018. Before that, the state do not have a fee schedule. The introduced fee schedule combined elements of multiple approaches. So many hospital outpatient services, including operating room fees, are covered by fixed amount fee schedule rates. Meanwhile, payments for many other services like anesthesia, recovery room, medical and surgical supplies are subject to a percentage of charges. In contrast, most of these services that performed in ASCs are also covered by fixed amount fee schedule rates. In other words, the Virginia ASC fee schedule covers a larger number of services than the hospital fee schedule. 
Here we show you that the Virginia Workers' Comp ASC facility payments per, uh, per episode for common knee and shoulder surgeries decreased significantly in 2018 following the adoption of fee schedule. That is the blue line at the bottom on both charts. In contrast, the hospital outpatient facility payments per episode in Virginia remained fairly stable or uh, continued growing for these common surgeries. These diverting trends are related to the nature of the Virginia fee schedule we just talked about in the last slide. Since the ASC fee schedule had a larger number of services covered on a fixed amount rate, the growth in payments was contained by the fixed reimbursement. So now we'll look at Georgia as an example of a state follow the Medicare APC-based fee schedule. Georgia adopted a workers' comp outpatient fee schedule for both hospital outpatient and AIC in 2014, which based upon the Medicare hospital outpatient prospective payment system. OPPS is also known as APC-based fee schedule. The new fee schedule rate set at 225% of the final Medicare OPPS payment rates for both AIC and hospital outpatient facility services. In the subsequent years, Georgia updated its fee schedule largely to reflect Medicare changes. In 2018, Georgia separate, uh, in, uh, changed the uh, AIC fee schedule rate to a separate level, setting at 210% of Medicare OPPS payment rate. The hospital outpatient fee schedule rate remained at 225% of Medicare OPPS rate. So in this example, we'll see how the Medicare changes influence the actual Medicare, uh, facility payment in workers' comp in, uh, in Georgia. So CMS implemented several important changes in um, Medicare APC-based fee schedule after 2014. One important change is the introduction of the Comprehensive APC, or CAPC. Under this approach, all supporting services and the secondary surgical procedures became packaged into the payment rate for the CAPC and were no longer separately reimbursable. Note that this change is only for facility payments. It did not affect the surgeon fees. Georgia workers' comp fee schedule followed the Medicare introduction of CAPC while allowing separately, a separate reimbursement for specific devices and implants. It also excluded the portion of the APC payment associated with this reimbursement from the Georgia workers' comp fee schedule rates. Medicare also restructured the APC groups in 2016 and 2017 for most common surgery types. Here, we just show you a few examples. This change can increase the um, Medicare OPPS payment rate for some surgeries and decrease the Medicare OPPS rate for others, depending on how the relative weight for that APC group changed. Now let's look at the trends in Georgia workers' comp ASC facility payments. The changes in Medicare was a, an, an important factor underlying the various trends we're showing you here on the workers' comp side. The two bottom lines on this chart shows that for two uh, common knee procedures, common knee orthoscopic procedures, the actual uh, facility payment for AIC in Georgia increased 10 to 12% from 2014 to 2018. The Medicare's restructuring of APCs in 2016 was a contributing factor in the uh, AIC facility payment increase in that year. And the decrease in facility payments in the subsequent year mainly reflected the introduction of a CAPC from the Medicare side. On top of this chart, you see for uh, this particular knee surgery, um, the story is different. So this procedure, the facility payment for ASC facility in Georgia increased in 2014 following adoption of a Medicare fee schedule. Then from 2014 to 2018, this measure decreased 27% uh, during that period. 
the main contributing factor to this decrease was the reassignment of the uh, Medicare APC group um, for this procedure, which lead to a lower relative weight for that APC group and therefore lower payment level. So in our study, we also uh, look at the shoulder surgeries and we see similar story here. The Medicare changes was the main factor underlying the different trends for shoulder uh, procedures in terms of AIC facility payment in Georgia. We also see evidence of other factors, for example, the changes in uh, multiple surgical procedures, how frequently they're provided, as well as changes in, in negotiated prices um, also contributed to the uh, changes in ASC facility payments. So here we summarize the fee schedule choices and other factors that may influence outpatient facility payments and trends that we discussed today. This concludes our presentations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rebecca and Bogdan, for sharing those findings from our, from our benchmarking reports. Thank you very much. Um, we have a few time for a few questions, and we'll go to one for Bogdan from Brian. Is the change in employment measuring full and part time or only full time job losses? Um, thank you, Brian, for this question. Uh, there is there is plenty of information uh, from all different perspectives uh, about how labor market behaves. Um, in this specific example, in our presentation, I highlighted a couple of measures. One of them, long percent of people who are long-term unemployed and percent of people who have part-time jobs, even though they wanted a full-time job. Um, but currently, if you think about the economy, there are about 10 million people who do not have a job but are looking for one. And about 6 million people, and that's the numbers that I presented, um, are working, have a job, but they only could find a part-time job and would like to have a full-time job. Um, just for the data geeks in the audience, I actually would advise to you know, you know play with the Federal uh, Federal Reserve data uh, website um, that has information. It's called FRAD. If you Google FRAD data, you can see lots of different graphs. Uh, BLS produces lots of different numbers on the economy, and that's uh, it's 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 a great resource of understanding where economy is going. Okay, another question for you, Bogdan, related to non-COVID claims. Yesterday, there was a presentation that demonstrated an expected decrease in claim frequency during 2020. Based on the 2008 data that you shared, would we expect similar claim frequency trends during this time? And do you have any indication on how claim severity changed in 2009 as well as in 2020? So those are really good questions. and. Uh... It's it's fairly you know the the way I try to sometimes understand how claiming claim frequency the, the changes in the recession is trying to think about nature like type of workers that remain working during the recession and what are the underlying frequency rates for those workers right even if you keep the industry constant which we cannot really do in this recession but assume we can. Um, the types of workers who remain in the job are different, right? If um, if you think about who are the first people who get laid off, there's probably people who have the least experience. And those are the workers who are more likely to get injured. And thinking back to, um, to the recovery, you have the opposite effect. In a recovery, the first people who are get hired, they might not have uh, as much experience. And if you're working in like say in industries that are affected the most right now is restaurants. Well, you know, you are dealing with fire and sharp knives. What could go wrong, right? So people who don't have experience working in those industries, you'll have, you'll see an uptick in uh, injuries during the economic re recovery. Um, thinking about the second part of this question about claim severity, you know, we've seen change in use of care uh, for people who are. Uh, who are injured. Is it really injury severity or is it just like prolonged care because there's fewer jobs uh, to find, uh, the fewer jobs to return to? We don't know that yet, but that's something they can study more. 
Thank you, Bogdan. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, we're moving into a break now. Um, before we sign off right now, uh, don't forget to rate your session. Uh, if you take a moment to do that, and if you have time during the break, pop over to the exhibitors hall and take a look at the folks over there. Thank you very much. We'll see you at the next session.